Tim is based in Liverpool with his family and he's also been a very generous host to many of the Christians on the left team when we visited Liverpool for the Labour Party conference several times over the years. Uh, we're really sad not to be experiencing that hospitality again this year uh, due to the cancellation of party conference, uh, but we're delighted nonetheless to be hosting Tim this time online rather than in person. Uh, so how this is going to work is Tim's going to speak to us for about 20 to 25 minutes or so, uh, then we'll use the Zoom breakout room function uh, to get into smaller groups and discuss some of the questions <laughs> and the themes that Tim has, has raised. Uh, then we'll all come back together to kind of share some of the ideas from that. Uh, so with no further ado, I'd like to hand over to, to Tim and I think there's some slides which you should be able to see on the screen as well uh, if you get the, the slide sharing thing which Dan will do for us there. But yeah, Tim, over to you. Okay, thanks Hannah. Um really happy to be doing this um i've been wrestling with a lot of this stuff for quite a few years so um <clears throat> um so it's good to be able to share some of it and to take it a bit further and see what some of you guys think as well um we're going to be looking at god as an economist and looking at um some of the sabbath jubilee <clears throat> excuse me um economics around that um just to say before we start the biblical material is so vast that it's nigh on impossible to do justice to it in the 25 minutes or so whatever we whatever i have but just by way of introduction i just want to say this jubilee or sabbath economics is a description of what the good life looks like it, it's what god's economy looks like it's economics for the common good it's economics for everybody um it's the economics of shalom um and it's how to live in such a way that meets everyone's needs generation after generation um and it's the economic structure which god instructed his people to observe and i believe it becomes an opportunity um to rethink to reimagine the political economy and where its resources are benefit to the entire community even for those as we will see in a few minutes even for those who are non-producers within the economy so what we we are given by god um, is a vision of social and economic justice actually it's it's probably a, a lot more than that um, as Brueggemann would say, it's a resistance to the culture of now. It's saying, I think his book title was, it's saying no to the culture of now. So the word Sabbath just means, literally means to rest and to stop working, which is very apt for these times. So very briefly, we're going to look at some of what this was. And maybe more importantly, um, begin a conversation, begin a discussion of what this might mean for our economy today. <clears throat> you know, we don't always um, see God as an economist. In fact, I would say it's something that we rarely find talked about in the church. But I do believe um, that it is a fully appropriate way of describing both his character and his work maybe not in terms of an economist in the way that we've understood it in the last hundred years or so with guys like um adam smith milton freeman hayek john maynard keynes karl marx or maybe some of the more recent ones like thomas piketty or joseph stiglitz so it's something a bit different from that the greek word for economy um, is oikonomia which sounds pretty much like it and it comes from two words oikos is the house and nomia is the rules or the law so it literally means to manage the house but the house here is quite inclusive it includes the individual it includes the family it includes community and the wider society so um dan if we can have the next slide up Okay, um, I just, what I want to say, it's the second slide, Dan, if you can get it up. Um, what I want to say just a little bit on, and this is just to give you a heads up, 
is um, we're going to be looking at um, Sabbath and creation. Um, that's the one. Sabbath and creation, Sabbath day, and then very quickly, really quickly, Sabbath year, year of Jubilee, and maybe just one verse looking at something in the life and the teachings of Jesus and where we can have some feedback from you guys okay next slide Dan so we're now looking at um, I want us to start with Sabbath and creation okay it's important that we understand where the idea of Sabbath first originated from Sabbath appears in the creation story and God creates the world in six days and he declares it good um, that actually is a pretty weak translation um, I don't think we have the word in English but we could certainly do better than good um, it's almost words like adjectives like incredible amazing be closer um, it's almost like when you see perhaps you see a, a um, you know a sunset or something amazing good just doesn't do it justice uh, even the weight actually it is very good so god then culminates all of this good work by resting by sabbath and there's a number of things we could say here but i just want to throw this out to you um god is not a workaholic um next slide dan please um Another really interesting verse, and this is one just to get you thinking, really. I, I can't get my head around it, but I'm going to try and explain it the best way I know how. If you're in, and it's Exodus 31, verse 17. Now, if you're into this sort of stuff, from, a, I think it's around Exodus 24 to the end of 31, God makes seven speeches. And the first six speeches are all in regards to the making of tabernacle. And it's pretty tedious stuff to have to, when you listen, when you read it. Um, and the seventh speech is all about Sabbath. Um, and of course, you can imagine a lot of the Bible commentators have um, noted that it sort of links with the seven days, six days of work, and then the seventh one is sabbath where he rested so the seventh speech is all around sabbath and the very last verse of that talk on sabbath is the one you have on your screen now and it says on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed now i just want to throw this out to you the word rested there refreshed rather sorry there is a noun and it's the word self but here it's one of the few occasions where it's used as a verb so what it's saying is is it's saying god was refreshed or god reselfed himself and it goes against all our classical and conservative theology because it seems to be saying that he needed to be refreshed or he needed to get his self back as if in some somehow he was depleted in some way now i don't know about how you what you're thinking about this but for me it's just mind-boggling um, and it's certainly very challenging but that is what the hebrew word actually says i i don't know but i guess what we can say from this is if that god needed to rest then how much more us I once heard, and I put it on the screen for you because I just thought this was lovely. I once heard someone describe Sabbath as dwelling in the presence of the resting God. Okay, let's move on. Next slide, Dan, please. Okay, so I want us to look at the Sabbath day. So there are three parts um, to the Sabbath legislation. The first is the Sabbath day, and we're going to spend a little bit of time not looking at all the minute detail, but just some things that come out of that. And I want us to think a little bit first about the Exodus story. We all know the Exodus story pretty well. The Israelites, God um, has set them free. They've been liberated from their slavery and their captivity. But what is really interesting here is, um, I think a really important question that we need to ask ourselves is, is how come 
they were in slavery in the first place. Right? It's not a question that ever really gets asked. But why were they in slavery in the first place? And I want to just give you a bit of the background here. It all starts with Pharaoh having a couple of dreams. And you probably know the dreams. And I think the first one is, is he sees seven healthy cows, strong, healthy cows. And then the next part of his dream, he sees seven weak cows. And then in the dream, the weak, emaciated cows devour the healthy cows. And then in the second dream, or the second part of the dream, he then sees seven ears of grain that are healthy on one stalk. And then he sees seven weak ears of grain. And like the first dream, the thin and the weak ears of grain swallow up the, the healthy ones. And he can't get an understanding of what these dreams mean and he goes to his own people to get an interpretation and he can't get it and then someone tells him about this guy called joseph who's imprisoned who's able to interpret gene dreams so joseph comes to him and he interprets the dreams and he tells them that they are speaking of seven years of abundance and then it, there's going to be seven years of famine so the dreams are about scarcity and as we know the story pharaoh puts joseph into a very high position um, and he becomes this kind of what we might call today a food czar um, and what we see happening is is we have policy being formed out of a fear of scarcity and what we see is we see the creation of a food monopoly and food becomes a tool of control. And out of fear of scarcity, they accumulate. And so we then go a bit further down the story. We have when the famine starts to kick in, the um, peasants, the, the farm workers, they come for help because they have no food. And they come in the first year and they have to spend all their money that they have to buy the food. So Pharaoh takes the money from them. Then in the second year, they have no food again, they have no money, so they sell the cattle, all their cattle, all their livestock in order for food. Um, as Marx might say, they've now lost their means of production. And then in year three, they come back again, they have no food, they have no money, they have no livestock, and they then give Pharaoh all their land and they sell their own bodies into slavery. And as the years go on, we have the whole nation in slavery. So slavery happens because the strong ones work a monopoly over the weak ones. It's a manipulation of the economy in the interest of a concentration of wealth and power in the hands of the few at the expense of the majority, at the expense of the common good. So when we come to the Exodus story, it's all about God liberating his people. It's about God redeeming his people. The word redemption is actually an economic term. It literally means to be brought out of debt slavery. So today now, and I'm not saying I disagree with this, but we have made redemption solely about Christ paying for our sins. But I want to suggest that actually it's a lot deeper and it's a lot wider than that. So in the Exodus story, we have the Israelites being liberated and redeemed. So if we can go to the next slide, Daniel. OK, so we come to Exodus 16. They've been liberated. They've only been in the wilderness um, a short period of time and they're not enjoying it. And they're grumbling. You can read Exodus 16. They're grumbling against Moses and Aaron. And the Lord responds by sending manna from heaven um, each morning and quail each evening. And he gives them specific instructions. And I just want you to make note of these. The first one is, they are not allowed to hoard, okay? Unlike Egypt, whose economy is defined by sur surplus accumulation, 
because wealth accumulation is what empires do. Rather, what Israel was to do was to keep the wealth circulating, which is done through, through strategies, as we will see, of redistribution. Number two, they were to gather each a only the portion necessary for the members of each household for that day and they were to leave nothing over so what we have here is an example of god's alternative to the egyptian economy one that had enslaved them for years an economy of subjugation um, so god to use a bit it's a bit cheesy and it's well you a well-known phrase now god provides for their need but not for their greed in god's economy everyone has enough there is no such thing as too much there is no such thing as too little and there is no such thing as the 98 percent and the two percent um actually when we think about this it should remind us of some stuff that jesus said um, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Lord's Prayer, he said, give us this day our daily bread. He says, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, to what you will drink, or what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? He said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. Um, do not lay up for yourself, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust um, destroys or thieves breaking and steal for you cannot serve God and money so the Sabbath day it is described as a day of solemn rest a holy Sabbath to the Lord and what was put aside on the end of the sixth day for the seventh day didn't go bad and if you go out looking for bread or quail on the seventh day there wasn't any so the people rested um, it's always, I, get, I get the impression that it's, it was maybe a bit of an enforced rest, which is what um, we're, maybe some of us are experiencing a bit at the moment. Okay, next slide, Daniel. I want to look at, just quickly, very quickly, some aspects of the Sabbath day in terms of the Ten Commandments. Okay, there are two accounts in the Bible of the Ten Commandments. And you can see them up there, Exodus 20, which is linked more to creation. And if you read it in detail, you'll see why. And then um, Deuteronomy 5, 7 to 21, which is linked more to liberation and the Exodus story. And what is lovely about this, and there's a lot more detail in the text itself, but we don't have time to look at it, is the fourth commandment is to keep the Sabbath. Now, it's not quite in the middle. But the, I want to tell you the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, is absolutely pivotal to all the other nine. I'm sure you've seen this before, but if you look, the first three commandments are all about our relationship to God. It's a bit like the vertical access. It's our relationship to him. The first, number one, is you must have no other gods before me. Number two, do not make idols. Number three, do not take the name of the Lord in vain. Then we have the longest of all of them, which is the Sabbath, which is about rest. And then we have numbers five to ten. And here, this is like the horizontal um, axis, because it's all about our relationship to our neighbor, our relationship our interpersonal relationships within the community. So we have like, honor your father and mother, do not murder, do not commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness against your neighbor and do not covet. What we have here is, is we have the classic greatest commandment, which is love God and love neighbor. And we have Sabbath that sits right in the middle at the, and at the heart of it. Okay, next one next uh, slide daniel but I'll, the thing i want you to notice about this is it starts with deuteronomy 5 6 before we get into the ten commandments it starts with this and i want to tell you in all of the economic passages we see in the old testament where god is talking about economics these this verse and similar ones come up all the time and he constantly is reminding them, he's saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, 
out of the land of slavery. And then he goes into his Ten Commandments. So the motivation for obeying God is the memory of liberation from captivity. So Sabbath is not just a day. I remember growing up as a kid and my mum and dad wouldn't let me watch the television on a Saturday. Um, but they would, I never understood it because they would listen to the radio, but I wasn't allowed to watch Match of the Day. But so Sabbath is an act of defiance against Pharaoh's or the empire and any empire's oppressive system. And as we shall see, Sabbath um, begins to imagine an economy in which the community shares all the resources for all of its members, all of the people, all the neighborhood, all the neighbors. That all, it included the slaves, males, females, even the animals, even the land, even those who weren't naturally part of Israel. The Old Testament, when it describes them, it describes them as foreigners, aliens, or sojourners. You know, they weren't actually part of Israel, but it includes them. You will see God in his economic texts continually reminds them that they have to look after the aliens and the sojourners, even the unproductive ones, the ones who don't produce. And in empire, normally it's the ones who don't produce who are marginalized and forgotten. But God is saying even the widows and the orphans, the non-productive ones within the economy, they are entitled to this as well okay let's move on i'm going to do this really quickly now but let's move on to the sabbath year the next slide and um i i'll just, we've got two two texts up there but the first reference to the sabbath year or sometimes it's called the year of release is in exodus 23 and that is where that's one of the places where it says you shall not oppress a foreigner you know the heart of a foreigner you for you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. So it's a continual reminder where they came from. He also says for six years, you can call the land your own, but on the seventh year, your ownership of the land is revoked. The land is to be returned to the Commonwealth for those who have been marginalized or excluded by the economy. So in the seventh year, they are brought onto a level footing. There is a reset. It is, is, it is as if God is saying, listen, the land and its produce, it actually belongs to me. It doesn't belong to you. And we must never try <clears throat> and turn that gift into our private exclusive possession. It can never be absolutely privatized. You know, and the land and its fruit and its produce are a gift to us. Therefore, we should fairly distribute those gifts instead of seeking to own them and hoard them. So with the Sabbath, we have the seventh day, which is now turned into the seventh year Sabbath. So it is about rest again, but it's also about returning the land to the people. And to get a fuller picture of this, that is where you would need to read um, in your own time, Leviticus 19, Deuteronomy 15. Um, the Sabbath goals are what I've got on the slide there. There is enough for everyone. Number two, there is a prohibition of accumulation. This is something that Jesus talked about a lot, not accumulating for ourselves. It's quite the opposite of, I would suggest, the economic or uh, system that we are now in. Number three, Debts are wiped off the books. People who got into debt were forced to sell their land. Normally it was out of their control. It wasn't their fault. And then even themselves, they would sell themselves as debt slaves. So the fourth part was slaves were freed. Okay, so this is not charity, right? This is economic justice. And it stops the process. It stops the process of economic marginalization and poverty okay next slide we're looking now at the third part of the legislation which is jubilee and in the jubilee we have what is probably the fullest expression of sabbath jubilee it's we have seven times seven 
Sabbath years, which is 49. And then in the 50th year, um, we have the year of Jubilee. It's a sort of super Sabbath. Okay. And it was proclaimed with the sound of the trumpet, which is the yobel, I believe, which is where we get the word Jubilee from. And again, if you, it's not on the screen, but if you want to read the details of that more, it's that's Leviticus 25. And I want to say this because this is, I, mean, I don't know, this is probably a little bit, some people would find this a little bit controversial, but the aim of Jubilee is to dismantle the structures, to dismantle the structures of social and economic inequality. And this is done in three ways. Firstly, we have the returning of the land to its original owners. So we have land redistribution. No one should be permanently homeless. That, there's so much rich teaching that comes out of that. Number two, we have a release of each community, each individual, each home from debt. And number three, we have the release, the freeing of slaves. So Jubilee provides the ultimate solution to exploitation, to oppression, to poverty, to marginalization. Nothing has ever been seen like this before or since. And it has largely, I would say, it has largely been ignored by the Western church. Although there are today organizations that seek seek to keep the jubilee principles alive probably the one i don't think it's got it's come away from its christian roots i think but you can correct me if i'm wrong is the jubilee debt campaign which is still very much going so what we see in sabbath in Jub in the jubilee principles is a repudiation of our current economic thinking factors such as insatiable consumerism and greed individualism, unrivaled military power, the growing economic gap we're seeing between the haves and the have-nots. But you could ask, and we've almost, I've almost finished, but you could ask, isn't this just for the Old Testament? Well, we get a lot more of this. We haven't had time to look at the Old Testament. It would have been great to look at what some of the Old Testament prophets had to say. They all, or most of them, seem to protest at the economic inequality in Israel, keeping alive the tradition of an alternative economic story. But on the last slide now, very quickly, and again, we could have done the whole evening on this, but I want us just to look at one verse where we're looking at how Jesus continues um, the, uh, the um, principles of Sabbath and Jubilee. So probably the most well-known one, um, it's the well-known passage is this one, Luke 4, 18 to 21. Although there are so many others that we miss so easily where Jesus is actually talking about economics. Um, but here we have the classic one where he goes into the temple on the Sabbath day and he quotes from Isaiah 61 and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Practically every Bible commentator interpreter says that the Lord's favor, the year of the Lord's favor, refers to the Jubilee year. And after reading it, he hands back the scroll to the, um, to, to the person there. Um, and he says this, he says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Jubilee. The, the text, this text then becomes a reference point for the radicality of the gospel. It's the most socially radical gospel. So just to conclude, and then I've finished. So what does this look like in terms of a reordering of our economy how do we order the economy in ways that continue this practice we need to realize that israel that we've been looking at tonight had a very different economy to ours um, it was an agrarian economy economy but 
I would argue that even though you might not literally be able to take the 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 legislation of this of the sabbath day sabbath year jubilee and transfer it over today but you might disagree with me on that but i would agree that the principles still hold today as much as they did then we may not be able to reinforce it in the same way today but the question is is how can we imagine i look Walter Brueggemann talks about the prophetic imagination. How can we imagine an economy where the Sabbath principles hold? I don't know how many people are listening now, but some of you, I guess, um, are, if not want going to, but um, have some sort of influence in shaping public policy. How can they spill over into public life? Because I believe they should. So that's me finished. If you put up the next slide daniel i've got a series of questions there i think daniel's somehow going to put you into a chat room or chat rooms and there's no way you can look at answer all of those but if there's anything um that is not there that has grabbed you and you think is worth talking about feel free to move away from the questions